thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and to talk to you about uh, animal welfare issues. Just by chance, it turns out wonderfully for me because I have a daughter who's just started at Lethbridge College, so I get a chance to come down and speak to land producers and visit my daughter. So it's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. So thank you. Um, the video that you just showed uh, really takes a lot of the wind out of my sails. So thank you for doing, thank you for that because it's a wonderful message that you're uh, that you're putting out there for people to find. And I think that's just a wonderful activity and a wonderful, uh, a very nicely shot video giving a lot of information. Uh, the title is Animal Welfare, New Social Ethic and what it means to uh, future drivers and what it means to land producers. I don't know why that we use that title because I really don't plan on telling you what it means to you. You know better than anybody else does what it means to you. My job today is I wanted to give you kind of an overview of things that are happening in terms of animal welfare and I think things that are really going to be driving the issue forward. I don't think this issue is going away. Um, I don't think anybody in this room thinks this issue is going away. But it's actually becoming more and more important in so many things that we do. As a um, as a, uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of different issues. We're going to talk about attitudes, values, and economics, welfare and trade, science, uh, standards for, and, and assessments, and then education and outreach. I am a professor. Therefore, as a professor, I'm almost required to give you a definition of something. It's one of those job requirements. This is a definition of animal welfare. I often have discussions in the industry or uh, discussions among different scientists, different areas of disciplines that say there is no real definition of animal welfare. How can you define animal welfare and controversies about this? This organization, the OIE, is the World Organization for Animal Health. It is made up of the world's veterinarians. They have an organization in Paris. They've come up with a welfare definition. And a lot of it is things that you'd be very difficult to disagree with. It is about well-nourished animals, uh, not suffering, um, prevention from disease, etc. One of the key components in this definition, though, is that animal welfare has to do with the state of the animal. Animal welfare is not about handling facilities. Animal welfare is not about the type of flooring you have. Animal welfare is about the state of the animal. It is about what the animals experience. You may have been sold the best animal welfare handling facilities you think you could possibly have bought. You put them in your barn. Every animal that comes in slips and falls. You've got an animal welfare problem, regardless of the facilities you put in. So it's about, again, the state of the animal when we talk about animal welfare. Okay? Treatment the animals receive, which is often what producers are focused on, right, is what we actually do, is com covered by other terms such as animal care, animal husbandry, humane treatment. Okay. Animal welfare is about the animal. It includes physiological health, hygiene, as well as mental or psychological states of the animal. That's where we talk about things like you know, fear and stress. Those are psychological states an animal has. It has a physiological component, right? Animal welfare is about science, but it's also about values or ethics. Values and ethics play a huge role in today's discussion around animal welfare issues. Let me give you an example. Two dog owners met one day to walk their dogs. One owner had grown up in a small family that valued health, safety, and orderly disciplined behavior. The dog of this owner received regular vet care, two meals a day of low-fat dog food, and was walked on a leash. The other owner had grown up in a large community that valued feasting, communal living, sharing of resources, and close contact with the natural world. The dog, it was the owner's third, the first two had been killed by cars, had burrs in its coat, was fed generously but sporadically, and had never worn a collar in its life. Each owner, judging quality of life from very different viewpoints, felt sorry for the other's dog. What's the right way to raise the dog? How should the animal be? We often ask that question. You can see where people coming from different perspectives, different attitudes, having different values, might have very different answers to this question. Often when I ask this question, I ask a class of this, uh, a class of this question, well, now, now I teach at a vet school, so all the students think the vet care one is the one that, that really is the best one, right? But often when I ask this question, I get a split in the audience, a split between those kids that come from farms and those kids that are raised in the city, right? The farm dog versus the city dog they have very different values and attitudes, so it changes our perspective and, and idea around animal welfare. And that's really where the challenge comes in. 
Today's public, to be honest, has very little understanding of animal agriculture, very little connection with animal agriculture. Right? Where do they get their information from? It's a big question. I'll tell you this story about, it's actually a true story. At an agriculture fair in 1992, a woman stopped outside the dairy exhibition and explained to a nearby farmer that she did not want to go in and see the legless cows. She understood, she said, that modern cows have been bred without legs were, uh, and were kept on conveyor belts that moved them from one side of the barn where they were fed to the other side of the barn where they were milked. The farmer coaxed the woman inside where she was relieved to see that cows, well, they still look roughly like cows. This is back in 1992. This is the Royal Winter Fair in Toronto. This is a story in Country Guide magazine or a story, I can't remember exactly where this came from. Okay. The point of the story here is not what a silly woman. Right? The woman loved cows. She liked the animals, right? She just didn't want to go in and see what she thought had happened. What we're really talking about is her perception and her attitude and where she gets her information from. We have this problem of the perception of old McDonald's farm, right? We have this idea that farmers have what? Two, two, two turkeys, two sheep, two cows. They're related to Noah some way because they have two of everything, right? We have them in coveralls, straw hats, complaining about the weather and prices. Right? That's that typical view of what the farmer is. I once told part of the story when I was living in Indiana. I was talking about this whole issue around perception of animal agriculture. And um, before I, I, at the end of the talk, a producer came up to me and said, I wanted to talk to you about this old McDonald's farm perception thing. And I said, okay. He said, well, you know, I want to tell you, that I was, uh, I live out in the rural, rural Indiana. I had visited a farm, or I was visiting my, uh, uh, I was contacted by my, my kid's uh, school teacher. She was an elementary school teacher. And she said, well, I know you run a big farm operation type of thing. Would you mind coming in and talking to the elementary class about life on the farm and raising animals? She said, oh, I'd be happy to do that. So he set up a date and time. And just before he hung up the phone, she said, oh, and don't forget to wear your uniform. My, my uniform, what are you talking about? Oh, you know, the coveralls, the straw hats, the kids will love that. Right? Well, what she didn't know is this guy was one of the largest swine producers in the United States, had a corporate jet and served on the president's Agri agricultural advisory council, and really had no idea what, what was involved. This was in Indiana, a rural state, in a rural part of Indiana. Right? The teacher had no idea what farms are actually like. Right? So we deal with this perception problem. And there's this new perception, a perception that's found in popular literature, things like animal factories, milk, deadly poison, websites, Murder King instead of Burger King, etc. There's a lot of negative information out there, as you are well aware. That has a big impact on things like attitudes and values. And I really want to spend a little bit of time now talking about attitudes and values because they play such an important role in something called social licensing. This is a recent uh, Gallup poll, May 2015. They asked the question about whether or not animals deserve the same rights as people. Okay? And what we find is that 3% said animals don't need much protection and don't have to have the same rights as people. Okay? The seven, it went down from 71 to 62 in terms of some protection. And the same rights as people went from 25 up to 32% of the people that they asked. Okay. They've asked this question three times, 2003, 2008, and 2015. That is a huge increase in the number of people in the United States that believe animals have the same rights as people or should have under the law. That's a huge impact in terms of where things are going in the future when it comes to animal welfare. We have some information from Canadian consumers, a study done out of University of British Columbia, found that they asked Canadian consumers what they were concerned about when it came to animal welfare issues and their attitudes towards farming in general. What they found is that Canadian consumers had a strong preference for natural environments, 
They were opposed to a singular focus on animal health, and they really liked the idea of natural living. They had support for humane handling, preferences for small family farms, and they really were opposed to the whole issue of confinement. They had support for some of the contemporary practices that were going on. There was a lot of empathy for producers, so which is really good news. They felt that it wasn't producers' fault that they were in some of these uh, management practices, et cetera. It's more a case of having been driven there by uh, market forces rather than anything else. They were concerned about slaughter and transport, and they were very concerned about animal suffering and pain. These types of consumer attitudes, this is 2014, this is, these are the millennials that they're talking to. These are the people who are going to be the consumers and the purchasers in the future. Okay? We do know that these results are also supported by surveys all over the world, whether it be in Australia, whether it be in Europe, whether it be in North America. Survey results in South America probably are slightly different. Why is it important? It's important from your perspective because it's about something called social licensing. It's the opportunity to operate, the privilege to operate with minimal formalized restrictions right, based on maintaining public trust by doing what's right. You saw in the video you just showed, right? Why are you following the codes of practice? It's the right thing to do, right? That's a huge part of what happens in terms of regulations and guidelines in the future. A huge component of social license is trust, a belief that activities are consistent with social expectations and the values of the community and other stakeholders. Trust has become a major part of connecting with people who don't understand what it is you do, right? Don't really have any clue where sheep come from, right? Where their lamb comes from, right? So what we have is we have this situation where you have a flexible, responsive, lower cost approach or a rigid, bureaucratic, high cost approach. You have social license, you have codes of practice, right? Versus laws, rules, regulations, legislative actions. And a big part of this is values. And here's the kicker, and it's not really great for me as a scientist, a big part, a component of, of trust is, is competence. Uh, you know, knowing what you do, being able to do what you do, right? but the value similarity, the be ability to connect with consumers on a value basis on a, and developing trust is huge. Research done demonstrates that shared values are three to five times more important in building trust than demonstrating competence. So I can stand up and say something from an animal scientist perspective. You can stand up and say something from your expertise. Right? We know what we're doing. We're doing the right thing. Here's, here are why we are doing these practices. Right? Trust us. We know what we're doing. You have to demonstrate that you share values first. It's more important. If you want people to trust an industry, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have shared values. What does that mean? They care about animals. They have to understand and believe that you care about animals. Right? Why is something like the undercover videos that have been shot on chicken farms and dairy farms, et cetera, hog farms, why are they so effective in terms from an activist point of view? They're so effective because they're kind of saying, well, there's evidence here that you don't care. There's evidence that you don't share our values. Right? And what happens when you don't share the values? Well, it becomes a tipping point. You move from codes of practice and having social license to social control, regulation, legislation. Right? That's why I'm so impressed with the video you guys showed earlier and the other outreach efforts you're, you're undertaking because you're trying to reach out and demonstrate what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. You're trying to demonstrate that you do share values with the consumers that you're trying to connect with. Okay. So Charlie Arnoff's group, the Center for Food Integrity, some of this information comes from. Charlie always says, what does all this stuff mean? They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. 
They're not going to listen to the expertise. They're not going to listen to the fact that you've been doing this for X number of years, right? Until they think they can trust you, right? I mean, you do the same thing. Someone tries to come and tell you, give you some information, try to sell you something. Well, it's the person that you've learned to trust over the years that actually is someone you'll start listening to, right? It's the same type of idea. Now, one of the big things that's happening is this Eurobarometer study. It's a survey. It's a survey that's done all across Europe. They do it every 10 years or so. And they really ask consumers how they feel about animal welfare issues. Right? As we know, we get a lot of pressure from what happens in Europe when it comes to the animal welfare issue. Right? This is going to be extremely important going forward as, we, as they, these results, results start coming in. What we do know is that when they ran the Eurobarometer study in 2007, the last eight years of, of, of European policy around animal welfare has been somehow based on a lot of the Eurobarometer information. Right? So politicians say, we want to know what the citizens of Europe think about these issues, how they're raised, and then they create policies that are going to be supported by those citizens and reflect that. And just like everywhere else, the voices, voices of producers are, are, are getting fewer and fewer. I want to talk a little bit about understanding the consumer and what I think is another one of these major drivers that's coming forward. And that has to do with an increased attention to animal welfare on the part of agricultural economists. Okay? Agricultural economists have historically focused on costs associated with change in management to improve welfare the conflict between somebody saying they're going to spend money on buying animal welfare friendly products versus what they actually do in the store because that seems to be buy the cheapest thing rather than really care about the labeling information and they've done models around animal welfare and livestock production. I'm not going to try to explain this because I don't particularly understand it myself because it's all ag economist type of stuff but I just want to give you an idea that you have ag economists out there who are trying to model the world when it comes to maximizing welfare, including things like social choice into the, into the uh, uh, models, as well as maximizing profit. Okay. The models get more and more complicated. Here's an example of the trade-off between egg production, profitability, and uh, barn space and where you end up with maximum welfare, minimum welfare, maximum profit, etc. Welfare is becoming part of the discussion. Welfare of the animal is becoming part of the discussion when it comes to economic analysis in terms of production systems. Here's another example. This has to do with anatomy of market failure and, and improved animal welfare. Uh, they vote yes. Do they buy more? Yes or no, why not? They're not willing to pay. Uh, others aren't buying things. The labels aren't reliable, et cetera, et cetera. A whole analysis as to what's happening out there. Why are consumers saying one thing and doing something else? So animal welfare and economists and, and economics, the research in animal and agricultural eco economics is changing. It is uh, becoming more practical in the sense of trying to understand not just um, things like how many pounds per or how the profit is going to be, but incorporating social conditions, social concerns, things like animal welfare into those models as well because they're, having, they're starting to play a bigger role. That's wonderful news, right? Because if that reflects reality, that means that you should be able to get more inf information in the future about what does this mean if we adopt these codes of practice? Does it, give us, does it really give us more market access? How do we market that product? Those types of things. They're looking at different frameworks. So there are some individuals who have been looking at uh, the whole issue of subsidies to producers. So in Europe in particular and, and other parts of the world, you'll have a subsidy to produce a certain way that will come to you. Right? People are asking the question, is that the best way to drive animal welfare forward? Maybe people should be subsidized if you purchase animal welfare friendly products. Okay. And we know animal welfare is having a role in trade as well. We have conferences that are taking place. Your video alluded to that whole issue of will we have more access to markets as a result of following certain codes. 
Okay? I think the answer to that is yes. However, there's a big caveat, and that is you have to be able to demonstrate that you're following codes. That's where the assessments are such an important component. Because guess what? Just because you say you are doing something and you have a wonderful code of practice to hold up and show people, people will say, well, how do we know you're doing it? Right? The assessments become key. Again, why do undercover videos work so well from an activist perspective? Right? It's because they can go onto a farm that has a certified program, et cetera, shoot videos showing people not doing what they're supposed to be doing according to a code or a set of guidelines, et cetera. Right? And especially in the US, we've seen lots of organizations, organizations like McDonald's and others, Tyson, drop producers overnight as a result of they were on the program and now we've dropped them from the supply list because the undercover video sh has been shot at that particular location. Okay. So we do have uh, conferences going on in terms of global trade and farm animal welfare. It's becoming more and more a question at the global trade level. We have organizations like the International Finance Corporation. That's the World Bank. Why does the World Bank care about animal welfare? The World Bank cares about animal welfare because if you're a country that goes to the World Bank to get money from the World Bank to invest in agriculture, they want to know what is your animal welfare program going to be for that industry in that particular country. Why? They see it as being important in terms of getting market access. Right? Being able to ship your product to other potential countries is going to require some addressing animal welfare in some way. Okay. So we know, for example, there's um, if you're interested in the whole issue of trade and those types of things, this um, this uh, brochure is on the uh, uh, on the Canada website and the International Markets Bureau, socially conscious consumer trends, animal welfare. It's important to know what's happening in terms of animal welfare in order to get access to markets in the future and to put Canadian producers at, at, at that advantage. One of the big things from a world trade perspective, and Canada played a major role in this, is the EU ban on seal products. So there was a ban placed on, I just have to remember my next slide is here. There was a ban placed on uh, seal products in 2009 by the EU. And Canada fought this ban, right? And the ban was against Canadian, I think Norwegian, uh, f seal fur products. They fought this ban, and it ended up in 2014 losing, according to the World Trade Organization. So the ban put on sea fur by the European Union was considered okay. But it's a problem in terms of why it's okay. Historically, you're, you're not allowed under World Trade Organization rules to ban products based on how they're produced. Okay? A pork chop, a pork chop, a pork chop, a lamb chop, a lamb chop, a lamb chop, regardless of where it's produced, is considered the same, same way under international trade. So you don't have barriers put in place based on how the product is produced. Seafur was banned based on how it's produced. Canada said that was wrong. The World Trade Organization said that there is a clause that it is approved by, and that's the public morals clause. What that means is that the countries of Europe can decide to ban seal product because the bringing it into Europe causes such a threat to public morals, and people get so upset about this that it's okay to ban it. Right? Now. That has huge implications for animal agriculture. Right? The animal activists are thrilled with this ruling by the WTO. And the reason is, is because they see it as a potential way to put bans in place for bringing in agricultural products based on how the product is actually produced. What's happening with the new free trade agreement with Europe? There's only one statement in there about animal welfare, and that's that the, the European Union and Canada will cooperate and promote cooperation on animal welfare. I'm not sure what exactly that means. I don't know whether anybody actually does. I share that the story with you about the first uh, ban because this is at the very highest levels of trade. 
still involving the World Trade Organizations and rules under the GATT, et cetera, and what, you know, one part of the world banning product from another part of the world. That's huge. If it's happening up at that level, there's a lot more discussions happening at much lo lower levels between companies and organizations. Another driver of animal uh, be well-being in the future, welfare in the future, is going to be science. It has been a technical driver. Okay? There's been lots of developments. And I think we're at the point now when it comes to animal welfare science that there are general principles in place, and these have been identified by the uh, World Animal Health Organization. There's a publication out talking about general principles for the welfare of animals and production systems. Uh, underlying science and its application. We're no longer at the state of infancy when it comes to understanding animal welfare. Right? We have developed a lot of different, uh, different principles. These are a list of the authors of, that, of this paper. These authors represent some of the world's leading animal welfare scientists from all around the world. Okay. What do they identify? Genetics, environment, social behavior, feed water, disease and parasites, handling, knowledge and skills, and where painful procedures cannot be avoided, the resulting pain should be managed to the extent that available methods allow. And I highlight the uh, painful procedures in red because I honestly believe that painful procedures are the big issue right now. Every code of practice, every scientific review committee that I was involved with, and I was involved with three different species in terms of the scientific review for the codes, everybody's dealing with painful procedures. Consumer attitudes around painful procedures are also very, very important. Again, consumer attitudes, Spooner, they often, in that, in that survey that they did asking consumers, they talked about pain and fear, stress, suffering. Freedom from pain was further emphasized about concerns from inflicting of pain on animals without appropriate pain management. This is saying consumers don't understand why producers do things to animals that cause pain but don't treat the pain. They just don't get it. That is going to be an issue that people are going to have to address. Every industry is dealing with that. I have, a project, I have projects going down here right now at uh, the Lethbridge Research Station uh, on cattle, and we're looking at age of castration of, of cattle, pain mitigation of cattle. Um, it, is the, it is the hot issue at the moment, and it's a difficult issue to deal with. Here in, uh, in the U.S., or sorry, in the U.S. survey that was done, again, found a number of statements around farm animals and farm animal pain about that it's wrong to cause pain, they should be protected from pain. Um, statements like, it's no concern to me whether farm animals feel emotional pain, people disagreed with that. And about 80% of the people believe that animals have roughly the same ability to feel pain and discomfort as humans. If people are believing that, if people are worried about that, issues like castration without any type of pain mitigation, issues of any type of surgical procedure to an animal that isn't going to be addressing pain, is just going to be a recipe, it's going to be a target for activists to be looking at. So I really think pain management, and you know why? Because here's the deal. Everybody can get their head around what pain is. Right? You start talking about handling systems. This is a welfare-friendly handling system. How many consumers even know what a handling system looks like? Right? But they can figure out if you cut something and it hurts. Right? It's easy for them to understand that. It's easy to make that for activists and those who are concerned about animal, animal welfare, animal rights, to make that an issue. The good news is that when it comes to pain, we have lots of ways of actually starting to look at it. This is infrared thermography images. At the time of castration, blood leaves the animal's head and moves towards other parts of the body. We have shoots with different monitors on it where we can use force uh, plates on, on the shoots to see how much an animal struggles. We can put heart rate monitors on these animals. Uh, we can look at body position. I imagine many of you would say, yeah, I can tell my animal hurts. Maybe. People are starting to use um, play behavior as an indicator of uh, the state of the animal. This is a calf, a data from a calf, which they're looking at the amount of bucking the calf is doing. This is immediately after, um, I think, dehorning of this animal. Uh, this is the control animal, um, the displayed animal, and the animal that's received pain mitigation. The point here is that 
if you treat the pain, if you treat the animal for pain associated with dehorning, what happens is that they go back to nut, nut control behavior very, very quickly. Okay? So they're behaving just, they're jumping and bucking just as much as the animals that have had nothing done to it. Where you can see the disbudded animal, the dehorned animal, without any type of pain mitigation, their play behavior is way down. Okay? Suggesting that, that pain mitigation has some sort of impact on the animal. These are just other quick examples. This is a EG where you're looking at the brain waves. You can see that there's a change. If you look at that second line and you look at the fifth line down, there's changes in brain waves that are happening. This line represents the time that animals are castrated. So we see that there are something different happening in the brain as a result. We have algometers so we can look at actual sensitivity to pain. And this is just to remind me that there's all kinds of things happening at a molecular basis looking for biomarkers, physical markers in the blood, for example, that you can take to, to try to uh, determine whether or not an animal's in pain. This is an interesting one because it doesn't deal necessarily with pain specifically. It deals much more with depression. So people are studying whether or not the posture of an animal is actually an indicator of whether or not this animal is feeling some sort of depression. And they're actually looking at the height of the head and the angles. Um, and they seem to be convinced that they're actually picking up animals that are in a depressed state. We have research going on like this on the social function of pain-related behavior and novel techniques for the assessment of pain in lambs. Okay. This is a very recent PhD thesis out of Massey University in New Zealand. Um, and a lot of the work that this person did was looking at ear positions of lambs as indicators of different levels of pain. There is something called the Grimace Scale. The Grimace Scale was originally developed for lab animals, for lab mice, and it has to do with um, no pain present to pain being present and things like the, um, the, the tightening of the orbital sockets. You can see them getting smaller, right? The cheek flattening, the ear positions, and whisker positions. And so what you do is you have animals that you know that you're doing something to them that's causing them pain, and you start picking up these grimace scales and facial expressions in animals. Okay. They've now developed them for horses. So you have the horse grimace pain scale, right? Ear position, orbital tightening, tension above the eye area, strained chewing muscles, mouth strain, strained nostrils. By putting this all together, you get a handle. You're starting to understand by looking at an animal is that animal in pain or not? And if an animal is showing the most extreme signs, you know that animal is in a painful state. Lambs, sheep. This paper was published last month. Same group that did the horse paper just published a facial scale for sheep that you can look at sheep and see different components of it where the animals, they saw abnormal ear positions, cheeks, the orbital tightening again, et cetera where you can see animals increasing from a normal situation to a painful situation. How do they do that? They are looking at animals that they know have physical conditions that we think would cause them pain. Mastitis is one of them. Hoof problems are another, uh, another one of these. And so by looking at those animals that you know should be uncomfortable, uh, you're trying to treat, you're going to be treating these animals, you can get a handle of how is this animal different. You treat this animal, it returns to normal, when it's back to normal, how does it look? And it looks different. So I think the current measures used to success welfare will, will be improved. We're going to have new technologies. And I think there's going to be a huge emphasis on emotional states of animals. Emotional valence is whether or not animals find things to be positive or negative, and scientists are developing ways of actually looking at that. They're looking at biomarkers of pain and they're looking at the importance of natural behavior. That huge emphasis on emotional states, again, reflects not necessarily where producers, veterinarians, animal scientists are looking at how they're looking at the animal, but it's how the public in general and the consumers are looking at animals. They look at their animals through a pet filter. Right? The closest connection to animals is with their pets. Right? Pets are part of their family. I come home and my daughter would say, oh, look, we have this little Jack Russell Terrier. Thinks it's a dog, but it's something. Anyway, my daughter would say, oh, look, Snickers, look, daddy's home. 
I'd say, I'm not her daddy. And there was a very generational difference between how I looked at my pet and how my daughter looked at my pet. Right? That is huge because that emphasizes that emotional component. What is my animal feeling? Is my animal sad? Is my animal happy? Is my animal hurt? Right? Those are the people, those are, those are the, the types of, of relationships that dominate society and are being asked, they're going to be asking producers to be explaining things in those ways. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on standards and assessment because you guys have done such a wonderful job in terms of the code of practice and the video did a wonderful job of demonstrating the importance of the code of practice. Um, it is clear that there are standards and assessments that are going to have to be developed. Okay? They've been developed for all kinds of different issues. Uh, sustainability standards are now something that's being developed uh, in terms of raising a product, raising animals in a sustainable way. We've heard a lot about that here in Alberta when it comes to sustainable beef, but there's a sustainable beef roundtable at an international level um, as well. Um, there's a sustainability consortium project out of, the, out of the U.S., out of Arkansas, which is international as well. And I've spoken with those organizations on how to think about animal welfare as part of their sustainable guidelines. Okay? You can have different animal welfare assurance programs, and these exist for all kinds of different things. The one that you're most familiar with is going to be the non-mandatory code and guideline approach. That is the animal welfare codes of practice that you have, voluntary, right, uh, in, in a lot of ways. But there's regulations, government agreements, assurance program for corporate cu customers. So does Walmart, Walmart has announced that they're going to have certain programs in place for their supply chain. That will be a certain type of program. Right. Product differentiation and labeling, certified humane. You go to a Safeway store or a Sobeys store, you'll see Jamie Oliver by a certified humane sign. Certified humane is a labeling organization. They have a set of standards which are very different than your codes of practice. Okay. They would say they're much more stringent. Right. They go out, they have people, they go out on the farms, they assess farms. Right. They will then certify the farm and the farmer pays for that service. Right and they get to put the label on the product that comes from that particular farm. Those standards, again, they're happening at an international level. World Organization for Animal Health, again. This is huge because the World Organization for Animal Health is the organization that sets reference standards for the World Trade Organization. What does that mean? On a health side, if there is an outbreak of a disease in one particular country, Who's in charge of determining whether or not you're allowed to close your borders or not for that product coming in or those animals coming in? It will be the OIE. They are now involved with animal welfare because they see a link between animal welfare and animal health. And they've set a number of standards in place already. Um, and their website, I don't believe they've done anything on the sheep side of things. Uh, they've done beef cattle for sure. And I know they're talking about setting standards up for swine. Is that something that Canada needs to worry about? Probably not, right? When you have 172 countries that have to agree on a set of standards, they're going to be pretty watered down standards. They're going to be pretty basic things, right? Codes of practice are already well above that. You know this, uh, this slide or this process where you have the code of practice, you have specific code, uh, you have a development committee, codes of practice, animal care assessment models and, and assessments that need to be done in the future. And it all linked back to one another is the vision, uh, a Canadian vision. And it is so wonderful to have this type of approach happening at all different types of commodity organizations. Why? Because you don't end up, when I was living in the US five years ago, we are in a situation where every other organization was making up their own set of standards. Standards meant nothing because nobody knew what standards you were talking about. Right? You had this group over here with a set of standards fighting this group over here with a set of standards. It was a complete disaster in terms of um, in terms of kind of being able to send a message about what, uh, what animal welfare standards are being followed. You had a scientific review process that I went through that looked at a whole bunch of things in terms of animal welfare issues. Another really nice component of this process compared to other places is sending out, asking for a scientific review on specific issues and then incorporating those into the code of practice. Painful procedures, a big part of that. A lot of stuff that you've asked in the past for scientific review are a lot of things that animal activist groups 
uh, animal welfare organizations are concerned about when it comes to raising sheep and lamb. So many of these same things will, are on their list of things that are important. These are just some of the requirements around, around um, castration. There's tables, so you know your codes of practice well. My understanding is that there is an interim sheep welfare risk assessment in place, and that was an Alberta lamb initiative. And I congratulate you on doing that. I think that's absolutely wonderful, and it's based to be an interim assessment while the national, a national animal care assessment procedure is going on. That's huge. That's moving from I have a code of practice to demonstrating we're following the code of practice. And we're expecting our producers who are part of our industry to be following this code and we're going to have some sort of assessment procedure in place. Okay. Other organizations I know will ask the question, do we really need to have third party assessments? And it all has to do with who's asking the questions, who's asking you to demonstrate that you are following the codes. One of the most important code things about when it comes to your code of practice and developing your assessments in the future is to make sure that all those criteria are there. The management, learning, uh, record keeping, the resource base or how your building is designed, and the animal based performance. These are all really important to have. Historically, many assessments have really focused on resource based things because they're easy to do. What do I mean by that? How big is your pen? How many animals do you have? What type of uh, handling facility do you have, right? But again, it's about the animal that really matters. And these have much more importance uh, in animal welfare assessments than the resource. But all three are important. Resource-based tells you about risks. Animal-based tells you about what the animal is experiencing. If someone were to say to you, what's the state of my animal? Right? You don't go out there and say, oh, I wonder about the welfare of my animals today and you go and look at whether or not your handling facility is working well. You probably go out and look at your animal. Right? That's what the animal-based assessments are. And they're much more forgiving than, than resource-based assessment points. Finally, education and outreach. This is huge for organizations that are implementing something like codes of practice within their industry. Okay? When it comes to education and outreach, historically what we think about is producers, agriculture needs to educate consumers about what we do. Because as soon as they understand what we do, we'll be all on the same page, right? But they don't understand your values, they don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, it creates a bit of a problem. It's a wonderful activity. Your outreach activities are very good in trying to, to, in trying to do that, right? And you, know, you do have great efforts being done on social media and YouTube. Okay? But we also have to be thinking about the consumers. Consumers seem or say that they want to have more information about where their food comes from, how it's produced, et cetera. So again, your social media outreach on that works well. But what about the producer? What about members of your own industry? Do you understand or have any sense of how they learn? how to best effectively communicate with them. Okay. It is one of the most frustrating things I hear from different, orga different industry organizations is that they have these wonderful programs in place, but how do we get people to adopt them and use them? The good news is that there is research that is starting, again, one of these new drivers around animal welfare. This is something called theory of planned behavior. This is from a paper that said, understanding farmers' decisions with regard to animal welfare, the case of changing the group housing for pregnant sows. What are the components of that that matter to different individual producers and how do they decide to move forward and make those changes? This is just another different type of model. This is the different types of producers that might be out there, categories of hard to reach dairy farmers according to vet practitioners in the Netherlands. So they had a program in place to help with mastitis, I believe, and they ended up realizing that there's lots of different producers out there. There's the uh, do-it-yourselfers, the proactivists who really get involved, the reclusive traditionalists. I don't like it when other people are looking into my farm business, leave me alone, basically. And there's the wait and seers, the people who are, well, we'll see whether it works for somebody else and we'll adopt later on. Right? By understanding what proportion of your producers 
fall into these different categories, or how they fall in based on certain programs, you can develop much more effective ways of communicating with producers and getting the message out to them. When it came to the codes of practice on the dairy side of things, we asked the question at the university, um, to what extent, codes are wonderful, but is anybody actually following them? Does anybody pay attention to them at all? So we said, are the codes being followed at the farm level? What we found was, so this is the dairy code. Okay. Remember, every dairy farmer in Canada was sent a copy of the code. Right? And the dairy farmers of Canada know who is a dairy farmer in Canada because of the quota system. Right? Everybody gets one. We asked the question, have you heard about the code? 70% said yes. Everyone received one in the mail. Right? But only 70% said so they had heard of, heard of them. Have you read the code of practice? 40% had read the code of practice. Right? That's not surprising, really. I'm surprised that the number is actually that, that high. I mean, we all get things that come in the mail. It's like, oh, one more thing to look at, one more thing to look at, da-da-da-da-da. Right? Now it's more my, 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 my inbox gets full, and it's like someone will ask me two days ago, I haven't heard back from you. Or they'll ask me the next hour, I haven't heard back from you yet. But I'm still working on last week's emails type of thing, right? There's just so much information that comes in. But if you're going to create a code of practice, an assessment program, and think that you're going to be able to use it to promote your industry, convince consumers that you're doing the right thing, you need to be able to be better than this. right? We need to be moving forward from there. When it came to certain management practices on the dairy farm, there were things within the code that they were highly compliant with. So we went out and asked, visited a number of farms, and asked, Okay, are you following the recommendations in the code of practice? Not the recommendations, the requirements within the code of practice. In a lot of cases, they were. That's not surprising, <clears throat> right? Because there's a lot, lot of producers that are on the code development committee. A lot of what's in the code is stuff that people agree should be done on farms. However, we did find things like low compliance areas as well. Okay? Certain types of, of, of activities that were in the code weren't being followed on the farm. Now, that's wonderful information to have. And if you combine that information with the idea about how to reach producers, right, it becomes much more effective as a way of, of, of getting more uptake. What's the best way to get colostrum quality assessment up on a dairy farm? What's the best program to create, et cetera? I'm going to conclude. I'm going to say that animal welfare has become integrated with all aspects of animal agriculture. I think there's going to be new technologies in terms of the new drivers. The drivers of change are going, to, are going to change themselves. There's going to be different pressures from different places. And I think the influence of change, those individuals, consumers, other organizations that are going to have an impact on you as producers in the long run are going to continue to influence and grow. I don't think animal welfare is going away anytime soon. I think that you've made wonderful steps in terms of your codes of practice, your interim assessments. Um, and I think it's just one of those things that's going to keep moving forward.